A Louis Body Journey. As we were preparing for our annual visit to our primary doctor late November 2017, I suggested to my husband Joe, let's make a list of things that we need to discuss tomorrow. He immediately said, yes, I have to tell him about the forgetting. Relieved to not have to be the one to bring it up, I put it at the top of the list. In fact, Joe was not just simply losing names. He forgot his association with many people. Several times during our walks down Broadway, he was approached by colleagues, but he drew blanks regarding how he knew them, what department of the New York Times they worked in, or even if they worked there. Many times he was unable to introduce me to them because he couldn't remember their names, even though they were well acquainted with him. Our primary physician checked out Joe's memory with a few cursory tests. For example, his orientation to place and time, subtracting by seven from 100, and he passed the tests. He suggested that we wait for the results of the yearly battery of cognitive results from the Alzheimer's study that we had been participants in for years. Let's see if there are any changes. Then we can refer Joe to a neurology department if necessary. And we both agreed to the plan. The cognitive tests were given and reviewed within a few months and showed that in some areas of cognition, he, quote, performed below your peers in some tests of verbal memory and your verbal memory seems to have declined slightly since your prior evaluation. Coupling this performance with information obtained from his clinical interview indicated that he was experiencing mild cognitive impairment. And the study neurologist recommended that he be seen by both our primary doctor and neurologist who specialized in memory problems. She was able to facilitate an appointment and Joe was seen a couple of months later at the Pearl Barlow Center for Memory Evaluation and Treatment at NYU. After the neurological exam and interview with the new neurologist, I presented my list of changes I observed in Joe's behavior. He listened carefully and acknowledged the mild cognitive impairment and suggested a number of conditions that could be connected with verbal memory decline, including Alzheimer's, mild stroke damage, and Lewy body dementia, and ordered a more intense, complete array of cognitive tests. Joe had an increase in movements during sleep, during which time he jumped or rolled out of bed. He described these acting out dreams as small animals in bed or catching a ball that pivoted out of bed onto the carpeted floor. This REM sleep disorder is very common in Parkinson and Lewy body disease, and the doctor ordered a mild dose of over-the-counter melatonin nightly for sleep. When the results of the neuropsychological testing came back, besides the visual and recall deficits, Joe also showed low scores in executive function of the brain. This caused problems with problem solving, decision making, and difficulty learn, learning new skills. I could validate examples of this behavior because when selling our upstate home, I noticed Joe had a lot of trouble sorting and deciding which items to dispose of and which were to be sent to the auctioneer, mailed to our children, or sent to Goodwill. Even small tasks befuddled him and made him very anxious 
and he seemed to lose the ability to finish even a simple task. His interest in seeing friends, going places, or meeting people was diminished. In fact, he had become much quieter with very little participation in a social setting. I carefully noted his changes and losses and presented my observations at each visit. The neurologist was leaning toward a diagnosis of Lewy body disease, even though Lewy body dementia is the second most common dementia following Alzheimer's, it is often not diagnosed correctly and therefore not treated in a timely fashion or is treated with medication that has a worsening effect or even sometimes seriously contraindicated. The symptoms presented are a complex mixture of visual hallucinations but may also be auditory or tactile in nature. Changes in alertness and attention are noticeable, and there could also be Parkinson-like symptoms such as rigid muscles, slow movements, and mild tremors. The cognitive issues also include delusions and confusion, poor attention ability, memory loss, and visual spatial problems. Apathy and depression are also common and noticeable, and in our case, Joe's depression was treated with a low dose of Zoloft once a day. No cure is available for Lewy body dementia, but as symptoms appear, they can be treated with various drugs to manage and control these symptoms. Low doses of medication is the norm with careful observation to see if they are tolerated and effective. Often changes have to be made in the drugs themselves or a small calibrations in dosages or frequency sometimes helps. Confusion regarding physical directions can be a safety issue and often families obtain an alert bracelet to prevent getting lost. Luckily, when I noticed this directional mix-up happening, I always went with Joe to appointments because he became confused about uptown or downtown. His neurologist told him that driving a car was out of the question, and that was one less worry. In truth, he showed very little interest in driving and I had done most of the driving for some time anyway. Lewy body dementia and disease is hard to confirm by traditional MRIs, but a spec imaging of Joe's brain reported changes more often seen with Alzheimer's. The neurologist was not convinced and tended to stick with his original diagnosis. Sometimes there can be an overlay of both diseases and this confusion may cause an incorrect diagnosis. There are drugs used with cognitive decline, often prescribed for LBD patients, that are commonly used with AD. They are denizapil, memetamine, and rivastigmine. They are introduced singly, over time, and in a small dose. In hindsight, Joe's combination of prescribed meds seemed to keep the LBD on a plateau for several months, and a small dose of clonazepam kept the sleep hallucinations and acting out nighttime dreams, the REM sleep disorder, down to a once a week occurrence. Because the neurologist was confirming the LBD diagnosis, 
We read the information booklet provided by the Louis Body Resource Center and did a pretty good Google search looking at several sites for more information. We discussed it together, and even though Joe seemed engaged with the information I read to him, he didn't appear to be disbelieving or angry or in denial. He never doubted the diagnosis or brought it up in conversation. And it wasn't until much later in the disease process that he commented, I don't know what will happen to me. Or once he verbalized that, I've been sick a long time. All I could do was to hug him and say, I was always going to be there for him and take good care of him. Just as we were finishing up the sale of the house, Joe experienced the full-blown Capgra syndrome episode, a scary and memorable delusion where I became someone else in his mind. No amount of persuasion could convince him otherwise. I cannot imagine how much stress, anxiety he must have felt. I learned from my Louis Betty group more about it and their experiences sometimes were successful by either leaving the room or changing their clothes or reintroducing themselves. On one occasion during a particularly long episode, I asked my friend Joan, a nurse, to come and visit. She was able to switch him to other topics by chatting quietly until the original distrust and confusion passed slowly. He became quiet and seemed to enjoy the visit. He no longer demanded that I leave because his wife was due back and she would not like me being there. No amount of looking at photos of us together at weddings or on vacation or with our family seemed to create reality for him. Sometimes Capgar symptoms appear in times of extreme tiredness and sleepiness, I read. A visit from older daughter Alyssa and two grandchildren seemed to go well. He knew who the boys were and could interact for short intervals, but his behavior was somewhat unpredictable. And when he went to the terrace alone, they became worried about his safety. Could the visit have tired him out, I wondered? He was not impulsive before this, but this could be the start of a new chapter of the disease. Most caretakers report fluctuations in their loved one's ability and cognition. And the daily behavioral predictability of a typical LBD patient is impossible. Losses over the next many months were unpredictable and consistent also. One day, Joe didn't know how to use the microwave anymore or his phone. Other times he forgot to tell time or couldn't remember where the bathroom or bedroom were. He would try and turn on the TV with his cell phone. His use of eating utensils changed and he often forgot how to hold them. Cutting food into manageable portions was required so he could use a large spoon or fork only. In general, he ate well but in smaller portions and we enjoyed our afternoon tea together, having a nutritious snack and chatting. Constipation is frequently a symptom of LBD, but with the suggestion of the neurologist who suggested stewed prunes, that was solved. Keeping him interested in reading was accomplished with his Audible account, where he enjoyed listening to history books his favorite, until he couldn't engage anymore. His daily New York Times was way too difficult to read for some time, and eventually even the headlines were a challenge. I would read the shorter columns and stories to him. 
At one point, the time span to read was so short that it was time to cancel Audible. He couldn't understand the storyline anymore and didn't have the stamina to focus. In general, his movement slowed and his visual perception changed likewise. Instead of our usual 10 to 12 block daily walks, it was more four to five blocks now. Curbs and stairs were a visual trap and he needed to take my arm each time. Physical therapy and occupational therapy at home were recommended by the resource group and the agency came directly to evaluate him. He worked well with both young women who led him in physical exercises and word games, talking and support. It wasn't lost to me that they were young, attractive and attentive. And I noted that he looked forward to their sessions together. When he found the PT more difficult, I would work together with the instructor and help him finish the session. I also found a program and Zoomed, Zoom that worked with patients with dementia. And he enjoyed the weekly talking session, listening to stories, word exercises, and when he could, share or listen to current events. A suggested program given by the Alzheimer's team at NYU instructed caregivers how to do activities with their loved ones. We were together many afternoon playing simple card games, not solitaire, since the rules were too complex and Joe couldn't understand the concepts. We cut up greeting cards and seed catalogs and pasted them to plant spring vegetable and flower gardens. We colored, pasted, and labeled to design pictures that he liked and he could participate making. We sculpted with Play-Doh and played simple games like Bingo and Candyland. Everything else became too difficult for him. Inevitably, Joe's communication ability declined noticeably. If we had a visitor, he would sit and enjoy their company, but mostly said nothing. He could no longer tell a story or joke. Sometimes he would try and join the conversation, but more often times he would get stuck mid-sentence and say, never mind. New vocabulary appeared. For example, toilet was peddler and necktie became fishert. People with LBD experience changes in the autonomic nervous system as well. These changes are noted in the heart, glands, and muscles. For example, a change in body temperature from normal causing sensitivity to heat and cold necessitated adjusting our outside trips during the morning in the summer and the afternoon in the cold weather. The lowering of blood pressure and pulse rate can cause dizziness and fainting or falling requiring a two-step rise from lying position. An unpredictable urinary and bowel incontinence reminds me always to have extra pull-ups on hand. He was confused about who was in the house and seemed anxious about it. He would take my hand and say, come with me and take me into the bedroom where he was encountering people in his delusions. You see, he said, and point to a pillow or a blanket. I would repeat the response that friend Pamela from the LB support group used. Honey, I am not able to see what you see, but I know you are safe. 
He likewise was confused about exactly who was in his family. Every night after a prayer, I would say a God bless for the children and grandchildren before sleep and name them all just to keep them in his memory, if even for a few seconds. He did know that I was the mother, but wasn't sure who the little girl was, whom I assumed was granddaughter Sophie and not his daughters. COVID precautions prevented me from taking Joe inside a crowded supermarket or drugstore, but he would wait outside until I quickly grabbed a few items I needed. One day he got confused about where he was supposed to wait for me, and I had to I had the manager of the supermarket and the drugstore looking through their stores searching for him. It was only a few minutes, but it was a frightening eye opener for me. That episode prompted me to realize I needed a companion for Joe a couple of times a week. And, as usual, the resource group was able to put me in touch with an agency who had staff who were trained in dementia care and who were available. That solved my ability to shop and do errands without worrying about Joe wandering off. And luckily, he was receptive to the new routine. With each new symptom of his disease, another issue had to be solved, sometimes in a hurry. Advanced planning was nearly impossible because of the unpredictable and quick changes of this dread disease. Ordering a walker and wheelchair was a precaution I took and very soon after, he needed these devices. Taking medication was an issue that was tricky. To my surprise, one morning Joe dumped all his medications in a glass of water. And from then on, extra caution and observation had to be the norm, administering each pill one by one. One day he spit a pill clear across the room. Leaving the room for a couple of minutes and returning, I said very seriously that I'd just spoken to his doctor and he had to take the pill immediately, which he did without complaint. Who knew? Mixing up shaving cream and toothpaste became another confusion even with each one labeled with big letters. The solution was to buy an electric razor and skip the shaving cream altogether. Putting the toothpaste on the brush and handing it to him worked fine also. Dressing himself, however, suddenly became a problem when he forgot the sequence of layers. Shorts first, then two sets of underpants wasn't going to work. Neither were mismatched button-up shirts. Belts became difficult for us both, so we revised his wardrobe to include all pull-on shirts and pants. Skip the belts and buttons. I ordered a pair of sneakers for him that had Velcro closings and no laces as well. Even after we had placed large signs on doors denoting bathroom, TV room, bedrooms, Joe confused the front door with the bedroom and on a couple of occasions left. And I was unaware since I hadn't heard the door open or close behind him. Luckily, I had instructed the doorman and porters that he was not to go out alone and to stop him and notify me. On one occasion, we had a substitute doorman, and I rushed down to the front desk. He pointed out which direction Joe had gone. Quickly, I ran down Amsterdam Avenue, and about a block away, I saw Joe on his way back. 
With a sigh of relief, I took his hand and said, I missed you. Should we go home and have our tea now? Another time he left, but the staff located him on the 21st floor with the help of the security cameras. I think he was glad to see me when I collected him and wondered if he was as scared as I was. I had a chain lock on the door, a second lock, and an alarm installed. The door alarm turned out to be too loud and would disturb the whole neighborhood. But winding a simple bungee cord around the doorknob and attaching it to the chain worked just fine. In addition, my neighbor installed a lock on the terrace door for me for safety. Debilitative disease lead to other problems, and Joe developed a series of urinary tract infections that even though identified and were quickly treated by his primary doctor, he became more tired and confused. He spent more time resting and was less active. Noting that dehydration worsens with the problem, I pushed fluids of all types to prevent a hospital emergency room visits for dehydration. Imagine a long stay in an ER with a loved one waiting for treatment or to be admitted. Luckily, we did not have to deal with that issue and things were managed at home. After contact with Calvary Hospital, their palliative care resources were instituted and assistance given after an evaluation by their team. This support at home consisted of monthly nurse visits, weekly social work support, and chaplaincy services, if we wanted. However, more direct and hands-on care was what I really needed, especially after several falls because of Joe's extreme weakness. But first, one had to qualify to receive the hospice care needed. And for various reasons, Joe's symptoms, measurements, did not meet their required criteria. Falls are particularly upsetting. And even though Joe seemed physically all right after a fall, getting him back to bed was an art. Being alone, innovative solutions consisted of the chair trick that required getting him into a kneeling position and placing his hands on the seat of a chair that I moved very slowly to his bed. I then used a chest strap to hoist him. Another time he slid off his chair in the kitchen to the floor. Again, luckily, no visible injury. I left for a minute, came back, and told him in a serious tone that there were two policemen coming from the precinct to help if he couldn't get up. Somehow he regained enough energy to get to a kneeling position and miraculously back in his chair. However, one night he got up and had a fall in the TV room, luckily on a carpeted floor. I took a large plastic sheet, rolled him on it, and pulled him as far as the bedroom door. Then the night porter was able to help me get him back to bed. A few hours later after that, he slid out of bed again. So I just made him comfortable on the carpet with pillows and a quilt and waited for an aide to come in a couple of hours. When we realized that neither of us could move him to the bed, the aide suggested I call 911. I talked to a very nice operator and told her that Joe had no visible injuries, no bleeding, no pain, and it was not an emergency, but we just couldn't get him back to bed. She told me, oh, you need a pickup. She sent a couple of EMTs within short order 
without the dreaded sirens, and they had him settle in bed in minutes. They said that this was a pretty regular happening and that they were glad to be of service. Sharing the information with the resource the next morning was both informational and important and somewhat humorous. Of course, an expandable guardrail had been previously added to the bed, and each night now, an array of extra padding was added to the space around the bed, just in case. About this time, Joe, for the first time in his illness, became aggressive. It had started three weeks before, and it wasn't just aimed at me. The aide and I both cut the odd punch, but quickly learned to sidestep and anticipate this when we gave him care. My thought was he was so confused about what was going on, his reaction was to protect himself by lashing out. This was conjecture on my part since his communication skills had gone completely. His neurologist began a higher dose of creatinine twice daily to help the aggression, and it seemed to help. Our last visit to the neurologist was a difficult one. Joe had trouble getting from the walker in and out of the car. His neurologist's note described his condition as severely declined, unable to mimic thumbs up, said name, but unable to ID wife, minimal speech, unintelligible, eating very poorly and weight loss, recommend hospice care. He began slowly discontinuing his medication, advising which one to begin with and which one a week later. When I spoke to him privately out of earshot about Joe's decline, he said we would deal with his symptoms together with the hospice team and no need to continue his visits. His appointments with his primary doctor were discontinued also, and his regular six-month visits to the hematologist for his chronic leukemia diagnosed 10 years before were now discontinued as well. I felt much relief because the visits became so difficult for Joe and for me as well. Calvary Hospital reevaluated his condition and finally approved hospice care after speaking with the neurologist. New medications were supplied by hospice and the nurse explained when to use them and for what symptoms. DNR and emergency phone numbers were taped to his bedroom door. Comfort measures were supplied by a morning hospice aide who worked with my agency aide to get Joe out of bed for a short trip to the TV room to watch operas and music on YouTube. He loved opera and we had subscriptions to the Met and several other venues for years. One year I counted 13 operas we had attended in various locations, including upstate and downstate even student presentations in the city. It was his favorite pastime. Before bedtime, Hey Google played Pavarotti for him. Our daughter Andrea visited and made it her job to prepare nutritious blender meals, adding extra protein powder. He could tolerate small amounts and it allowed us to dissolve his crushed medication and fed him by spoon. We were very careful to observe him for signs of aspiration, coughing, or refusal of the liquid nutrition. 
We had agreed earlier that neither of us wanted aggressive hand feeding and had it entered in our living will. Discussions with the hospice team reinforced the idea that aggressive feeding was counterproductive and often caused more discomfort to the patient. On one occasion when I was upset and troubled about his nutritional status, I reread our legal agreement and was reassured that five years earlier, before Joe had dementia from Louis body, that was exactly what he wanted. I felt convinced and reassured that his present care was exactly what he deserved and I adhered to his wishes. When he was totally bedbound and not permitted up because it was too dangerous, I would go into his room and just lie on the bed opposite so I could watch and talk with him and keep him company. Finally, his breathing had become fast and labored and I administered the medication the hospice nurse Brandy had recommended for comfort. I noticed that his respirations were slowing and after a few hours, they stopped very peacefully and quietly. Hospice was notified and came to pronounce his death. The weekly chaplaincy team from our church came to give him communion just shortly after he had taken his last breath on June 17, 2022. The priest blessed Joe with holy water and we all said the Our Father together at his bedside. Joe loved that prayer and we said it nightly as we prayed for our family. Afterwards, I would kiss him and say, good night, I love you. And I still say it nightly now to keep his memory with me.